All right. Um, <laughs> so we're we're gonna get we're gonna get started, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to power through three examples today on the momentum and impulse section. And these are these are these examples are meant to just kind of cover the range and the types of problems that you might see. Um, different flavors and different uses of all the equations, okay? So hopefully this will give you the, the broad range of examples that you'll need to do a lot of your homework assignments and to study for the exams. Okay, so I'll start with the first example, uh, an explosion example. So what we have is a cannonball. It's getting shot out of a cannon, uh, and the cannon has this angle, theta is equal to 60 degrees with the ground. Uh, cannonball, you're told that it's shot out of the cannon at an initial velocity v naught equal to 20 meters per second. And then as the cannonball uh, gets ejected out of the cannon, obviously it's projectile motion. So it's going to reach this peak of its parabolic uh, path. The peak is, is our point B here, at which point the cannonball is going to explode and it's going to break up into these two fragments. And each of the fragments are going to have a mass of 2.5 kilograms. So just by, by deduction, that means that the initial cannonball was a total of 5 kilograms. And then you're told that one of the masses, you're given its direction and its, uh, and its final velocity, or its, its, its velocity after explosion. Mass 1 goes straight up, has a velocity v1 prime of 3 meters per second. And you're asked to find the following. What happens when these two masses eventually come back down, hit the ground? How far are they apart when they hit the ground? So essentially, you know, if you're out there searching for these fragments, uh, how far do I need to go to find the second fragment after I found the first fragment? OK, so the. The quick, the, the quick realization here is that what we need to do is use conservation of momentum. Okay, and the reason, re, the reason for that is first you're going to apply projectile motion kinematics from the first chapter, chapter section 12.6. We're going to figure out information regarding where the, where the cannonball is when it reaches the peak. Um, but once you do that, it's the explosion. Explosion is very similar to billiard balls colliding in that when it happens, you've got initial momentum in that system. It breaks into two fragments. It's got final momentum. But in the process, you ask yourself, were there any external forces that served as impulses? And the answer is no. There were no external forces in that explosion that for our purposes, served as impulses because anything that happened in the explosion, they were internal forces. Okay? So your best approach is to use conservation of momentum at the moment when the explosion happened. Then you follow through and do more projectile motion analysis to see where the particles end up uh, when they hit the ground. Okay? So let's, let's do that first. Let's get, let's get to the point where we know what the mass is doing once it hits its peak. So the first thing you want to know is, for instance, how high is B? That's useful because you want to know when the particle reaches that peak, you know, what's going to happen with the second fragment? How far does it need to go back down to hit the ground? So we can, we can use projectile motion information here. We can just basically say V final squared is your V initial squared plus 2AH is our unknown. Acceleration is just gravitational acceleration. So I'll just rearrange. H has to be uh, Vf squared. And this is obviously in the y direction, right? So apply this in the y direction. And what you have is when it reaches its peak, it can't have any velocity left in the y direction because it's, it's its peak. So this is going to be 0 squared minus initial velocity squared in the y. What is that? That's going to be your v naught multiplied by sine theta. Okay? So it'll be minus 20 sine 60 squared. That's your initial velocity. And then you're going to divide it by your 2a. And so that's 2, negative 9.81, because I'm going in the other direction. And so your h is just simply 15.3 meters. 
that is your point B, right? Okay. Okay. So we know where the we, we know where that cannonball is now in the air as it reaches the peak. Now the explosion happens. Okay. So what happens with that explosion? OK, so for the, the diagram that I'm going to draw for the explosion is, is basically going to be a before and after picture. Think about it. Momentum is all about forces, velocities, and time, not like energy, which is about displacements. So when we're talking about conservation of momentum, it's usually a before and an after picture. So in the before picture, before the explosion, right, you've basically got the mass, the full cannonball. And so we have to remember that this was m1 plus m2, the full cannonball. And because it's projectile motion, no forces acting in the x direction, we know that the initial x velocity is the, is the, is the same x velocity when it reaches the peak. So we actually know that this has to be a v0 in the x. Okay? So basically, we know everything we need to know about the cannonball before the explosion, it's only moving in the x direction, has v naught x equal to 20 times cosine 60, and then we know that the mass starts at m1 plus m2. So here's the after explosion picture. So the after explosion picture is you've got a mass that's now just the m1, and you're told in the problem that it goes straight up and has a v1 prime equal to 3 meters per second. Okay? And then you have a second mass, your m2, and we have no information about m2. So chances are it's going to be moving off in sort of in this direction. It'll have a v2 prime, which is currently unknown. And this v2 prime is a vector, and we don't know direction or magnitude. Okay? Everyone with me so far? OK. So here's where you would use your conservation of momentum. From before to after, the momentums have to be the same because, like I said, no external impulses are being applied. So what you do is you take, you take your conservation of momentum. which is a vector equation, and you start to break it up into its two component parts. So break into two components. Okay, so I'm going to do my x and I'm going to do my y. So here's my x direction. If momentum is conserved in the x direction, here's what you would see. You would have an m1 plus m2. And it would be all of the velocity not in the x, like so. And this, therefore, must be equal to all the momentum in mass 1 and all the momentum in mass 2. So you would have m1 v1, oops, v1 prime in the x plus m2 v2 prime in the x. Okay? And what we already know is that v1 only has a y component. So this is 0. OK, so let's see if we can even solve this. And the answer is yes. If I rearrange, I can find v2 prime in the x direction. I just have to do an m1 plus m2 v0 x. And I'm going to sub in my v0 x here. This is going to be 20 meter per second. And in the x direction is cosine 60. And I'm going to take that and divide it by my m2, like so. And what you get is 20 meters per second. So v2 prime in the x happens to be, 
That's 5 divided by 2.5 is actually 2. 2 times cosine 60, that's a half. It actually is equal to 20 meters per second. Exactly. OK, any, any questions so far on x component conservation momentum? All good? OK, so if you have that, then what can we do? We can actually do the y direction as well. So we've got one component of this velocity. Now I'm going to do y. So for y, is there any y momentum before explosion? No. None of the velocity is in the y direction. So it's 0 to start. And then the final y momentum would be m1 v1 prime y plus m1, oops, m2 v2 prime y sub y. So components of each of the masses. And in this particular case, both of them have y direction. One of them is up and the other is down. So it's going to be m1, 2.5 kilograms. V1 prime y is my positive 3 meter per second, plus 2.5 kilogram V2 prime y, which is my unknown. And if you work it all out, it should be very simply V2 prime y is negative 3 meter per second. And so that confirms my intuition that it would be in the opposite direction, right? OK? And that, that really should make sense to you, right? When, it's, when it reaches the peak, no y momentum. There's none, none of the cannonball is moving in the y direction. If it explodes and conservation of momentum has to be true, then as one fragment moves up, the other fragment must, must move down with the equal amount of y direction momentum. And because the fragments happen to be the same mass, they end up with the same, the same velocity. OK? So that's great. Now we have the y component. And we have this x component, which means we know the entire velocity vector on the second fragment. And that allows us to use projectile motion again to locate where the second fragment is going to hit the ground down here. So I'm going to draw this on this diagram now. The first part, the mass particle, m1, is going to go straight up. So when it comes back down, it's going to be right here. This is where my mass 1 is going to end up. The second mass, m2, is going to have this velocity vector right there initially. Here's my v2 prime. And then it's going to basically be a projectile. And it's going to land somewhere here, m2. And that distance is what we're looking for. So I'm going to apply that to figure out where my, where my mass 2 ends up. OK? So mass 2 now is a projectile. And we can say the following, y is equal to a y naught v naught p plus 1 half a c t squared. So back to your kinematic equations for projectile motion. Um, and it looks to me like final position of mass 2, this is 4 mass 2, final location of mass 2 on the ground. It started at y naught, which was our 15.3 meters that we calculated. Uh, this v naught, by the way, is only in the y direction, but it's now v naught. It's actually this guy, right? It's actually v2 prime y. So be very careful here. This one is now my v2 prime y times t plus 1 half negative 9.81 t squared. So as you can imagine, you can now solve for t. So you're going to solve for t. It's a quadratic equation in t, so you're going to get two answers. There's going to be a positive 1.49 seconds. And there's going to be a negative 2.10 seconds. Okay? And then from here, you can deduce that it's obviously a parabolic shape. The negative 2.1 was this you know, imaginary path tracing it back to where it might have started. So you're going to discard the negative number, keep the positive number, and that gives you your distance. Okay? So 1.49 seconds 
traveling in the x direction means x2 prime is v2 prime in the x times t. So this will now be 20 meters per second. That's this times 1.49 seconds. X2 prime is 29.8 meters. Okay, and so that is 29.8 meters measured from here. And that's your final answer. Okay? Let me give you some, some time to digest that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the, qu the question here, an, an interesting one, is what happens if there's wind and the wind happens to be blowing on mass one or mass two? Yeah, absolutely. Here's what I would do. I would take your position point B and assume that you still did all of your analysis initially for before the explosion. Let's say after the explosion it blows up and you're given some initial information. Yeah, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to apply a wind force on a particle, and that wind force, maybe it acts in the x direction, pushing it a certain direction, then you have to know how long that force was being applied and how much it would carry that particle. So that would be like an extra level of analysis. But obviously here we would, we would make sure to make it clear whether or not to include wind as part of your analysis. Okay? Let's not, let's not worry too much about that. Any, anything else? So this is first example meant to be like, let's, let's warm up with some conservation of momentum. Let's do, let's do a second example. Okay, so here's my example number two. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up a system of two hanging pendulums. And so the first one is going to be a mass A. And it's going to be right next to a mass B. Okay, so, so here's, my, here's my problem. Two hanging pendulums, they're right beside each other, and if they were sitting still, uh, A and B would be just making contact at one of their surfaces, right? And what you're going to do is you're going to lift up ball A to an angle of theta, and at this particular location, at this height, it's going to fall back to its original location, and it's going to impact B and B is going to swing up. We're telling you that A is going to sit completely still and hang straight down, and then you're asked to find theta prime. Okay? Is that good? Clear? Okay, so I'll write down the, the details of the problem. Find theta prime. 
you have a question here, or are we good? Okay. Find theta prime for B. After impact, if A stops immediately after impact, OK? So I could, I could change this problem, and I could easily say that A bounces off of B and goes backward. And so there are, there are variations to this problem. I'm telling you that A is going to stop right after impact. Uh, system starts from rest. With, with A lifted up to that angle theta. Theta is initially 70 degrees. And you're told the two masses. So MA is 1.5 kilograms, and MB is a bit heavier, 3.0 kilograms. OK. Okay, so how do we how do we tackle this? So you've got you've got a collision of the two particles happening right here. Okay? So so what are we what are we planning on using there when it hits something and it's got an impact? It's gonna be conservation of momentum, right? But in that conservation of momentum, you're gonna you're gonna first need to figure out how fast was A moving initially, right? And in order to figure that out, you've got to know where it started from when it was hanging above that height, right? So how do you do it? It's a pretty simple problem. It's actually going to be first conservation of energy. The reason, no non-conservative forces, there's no friction involved, but it's going to be lifted up so that it has some potential energy. Are we OK there? Do we have a question or no? OK. Just, just to be clear, if you have questions, just let me know. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out if A is first an HA above that, that uh, horizontal datum line, which I consider to be my y is equal to 0. Okay, And so as this particle A is lifted up, we want to know how much potential energy it first has. Then it's going to fall back down here. It's going to have kinetic energy. It's going to make an impact. Then this ball is going to rise up. That's also a third piece conservation of energy again. OK? Is that, is that clear? So I think we're going to do a three-step process. We're going to start with your conservation of energy. And this will be A falling. And I'm going to call that my 1 to 2. And then you're going to do conservation of momentum. And that'll be A hitting B. I consider that to be like a 0.2 to a 0.3 in, in, in the problem. And then let's do a conservation of energy. Again, 4B uh, moving up. And I consider that to be 3 to 4. OK, so it's almost like three stages moving from different locations. So I'm going to start with my A. OK, so conservation of energy is actually a really easy one. It's just recognizing that it's going to be your, what do I do here, TA1 plus VA1 is equal to a TA2 plus a VA2. Right? So there are, there are no springs. There's no initial kinetic energy. Right? We're assuming that the lowest position of those two particles is my zero potential energy. It's really, it's really just this, an MAGHA is equal to a 1 half MA, and then that velocity at 2, like that. Pretty simple. And all it takes is for you to do a little bit of geometry to figure out HA. Here's the geometry. Right? So the length of the rope is clearly the same length all the time. It's just L, and I didn't even give it to you. 
But if this is L, the hypotenuse of that triangle, this is L for the whole length, and this is my theta, then that means that this part alone is just an L cosine theta. And so if this whole length of the rope is L, then this part here is HA equal to L minus L cosine theta. Okay? So it's just a little bit that height where you've done the subtraction. And so very easily you could do VA square, uh, VA2 is going to be equal to MA's cancel 2GL1 minus cosine theta. And I'll even, do a, I'll even do a half step here to give you some numbers to work with. So this is just 1.147 square root of GL. OK, so you have the velocity initially, and then it's time to do your conservation of momentum. So it's going to be impact. It's going to be a before versus after for conservation of momentum. And so we have MA and then your VA2. Everything is happening in the x direction. And you can even say, just to be clear, there's an MBBB2, but clearly the Mass B was just hanging straight down, so that's zero. And then you're told to find M A V A, and I'm going to use my, I'm going to use the number three just to, you know, indicate here that it's from point two to point three. So M A V A three plus M B V B three, like that. And because I told you also that V A is hanging straight down immediately after impact, it also has zero velocity. So you're left with just MAVA2, MBVB3. And so VB3 is just MAVA2 over MB. So 1.5 kilograms over 3.0 times 1.147 GL. So VB3 is 0 0.574 square root GL. OK. So finally, third step, now that you have velocity of the, of, of the particle B right before, right after it's been hit, now you can use conservation of energy again, which will look very much like this. We're going to do this. Uh, conservation of energy for B after impact. So I'm going to now do a TB3 plus VB3, TB4 plus VB4. And Starts from the bottom, so there's no potential gravitational potential energy. Reaches its highest point, and therefore doesn't have any final kinetic energy. And so we're left with 1 half mb vb3 squared mbg h b. So 1 half, 3 kilograms, and then the velocity squared. 
0 0.574 GL all squared, 3 kilogram, 9.81, and then HB4, this is going to be L1 minus cosine theta prime. Okay, so I'm using the exact same geometry here, and then I'm going to give you the L, the length of the rope, and then the new angle that we're after is the theta prime. Yeah. Is that three? Yeah, it's three kilograms. It's the second mass, right? It's this mass here, MB. Oh, sorry, am I writing one third? Why am I doing that? Of course. Sorry. Yeah. How do I know the length of the pendulum is the same? You were, it, it was in the diagram. They have to be the same if they're both hanging down and they're able to impact each other. We're going to assume that it's a long rope. They're impacting at their centers, right? And so, like, I've drawn it so that A and B have different masses, but they have the same shape. So let's assume that the particles have the same radius, and one is just denser than the other. OK? OK, so you're going to solve for this. Theta prime is 33.3 degrees. And that's your, that's your final solution. OK, any, yeah, questions? Yeah, OK, so listen, lots, lots to talk about for this problem, right? So is everyone, is everyone good with the math, at least? OK, everyone good with the three-step process? OK, there's, there's a ton to talk about here. There's actually a whole section in your textbook on impact that I haven't talked about. When it comes to impact, it all depends on the material that you're dealing with and the type of collision. So you can imagine if your, ball, if your particles are really, really hard and stiff and they bump into each other, you end up with what is called an elastic collision. And when the collision is elastic, you tend to lose less energy. In other cases, if you, for instance, have a ball made of, made of clay and you smash it up against the wall, the ball is going to deform and you have what is called inelastic collisions. And all of this is wrapped up in just the type of material that you happen to be using, et cetera. Here's what we do know, though. If I, if I went back to this problem, here's what you can check. I use conservation of mass during the impact, right? Why, why, is, it, why is it that the velocities actually change so significantly and the ball didn't go back up to the 70 degrees, right? And why is it that I'm allowed to use conservation of momentum, but I'm not allowed to use conservation of energy? OK? So the reason is the following. If you did kinetic energy of particle A right before it hit, and then kinetic energy of particle B right after it was hit, you actually notice that if you take those velocities and you calculate it out, you lost a bunch of energy. The energy was just gone. That energy is energy lost due to friction and due to sound and everything else. OK? So conservation of energy is not guaranteed during an impact. Conservation of momentum is guaranteed because, again, there were no external impulse forces. Okay? So that, that, that's just very clear. And by the way, there is like one perfect scenario where you will have an elastic collision and the ball B rises back up to 70 degrees and it goes back and forth. So theoretically, that would happen if the following were true. Mass A and mass B happen to be exactly the same mass. So you have 1.5 kilograms in mass A, 1.5 kilograms in mass B, and you restrict it so that mass A comes down and stops immediately and doesn't bounce back, then all of that energy gets transferred to mass B, and then you have no loss in energy, theoretically. Right? Theoretically. OK, so lots, lots to talk about here, but I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to see if I can squeeze in the start of another problem here. OK, let me do, let me do 
OK, so I'll give you, a, I'll give you just a very, a very basic question. You're all, you're all familiar with you know, hitting a home run in baseball. Um, and so I'm going to ask a very simple question. How much force do you think is needed from the bat onto the ball to hit a home run? OK? So I, you, I can almost give you this question with absolutely no information except for this. And as engineers, you might be given these open-ended problems. And you have to just start by making some simple assumptions. Okay, so if I gave you this question, where do you think you might want to start? I think, obviously, we're, we're, looking, we're looking at what it means to even hit a home run in baseball. How far does it have to travel? What does the path of the baseball look like? Here's where I would start. Clearly, projectile motion, right? So I'm going to say the following. Let's say you've got the baseball player right here. Here's the baseball bat. Here's the ball coming at him. And the baseball is going to travel. There's going to be lots of wind resistance in this problem, right? But let's ignore the wind resistance. And I need the baseball to clear the fence. And I'm going to assume the fence is roughly three meters high. And usually the fence is, depending on where you are in the baseball park, usually it's about 400 feet away from where the batter is. OK? And so I'm going to give you lots of information. You can look this all up. Mass of a baseball is of roughly 150 grams. Uh, let's say that the baseball is being pitched by the pitcher. It's being thrown in this particular direction. And it's a fastball, so we're going to assume that initial velocity is 90 miles per hour. Right? And it's going to be in the negative x direction. Okay? And usually, after the ball is hit, in order for this to clear the fence, I would say the best angle that you're going to be aiming for of the ball's trajectory, I'm going to make this 40 degrees. Okay? So 40 degrees is a nice, nice even number. If it's too shallow, ball will never clear the fence. Right? It's going to be in the infield, or it's going to be a grounder. If it's too high, it'll be just a pop fly. 40 degrees is going to clear the fence for you. Okay? So here's the setup for the problem. How do we determine the amount of force needed to hit this baseball? We're going to have to use momentum and impulse, because it involves this direct contact of the bat to the ball, which is an external impulse force. OK? Yeah. Does the mass of the bat matter? So we're, we'll take a look at that. Let's do, what are, we, what are we going to draw the free body diagram for? It'll be for the ball, not the bat, right? So the ball, the ball is, the, is the operative thing here. So let's do the projectile motion analysis. OK? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to quickly speed through this. Projectile motion analysis will give you this initial velocity that I actually left unknown initially. So this is my v, uh, let me do this, v2. The idea is baseball is hit by the bat, gets a new velocity after impact. I'm going to call that v2. And projectile analysis says that v2 must be a certain value for the ball to clear the fence. So I'm going to give you this v2. V2 must be 34.9 meters per second, given all of my projectile parameters right there. Here's where the moment, momentum and impulse section applies. So you've got the bat surface. Here is my initial V for the baseball, like that. And now it's going to create v2 like that. Let's do v1. OK? 
So this is, this is the scenario of the momentum problem. And so what do you do with your impulse equations? You're going to break them up into x and y components. OK, so you're going to get an x direction. And the x direction says the following. We're going to have an m, the mass, mass of the baseball. It's going to be initial velocity in the x. OK, so negative 90 miles per hour, which, by the way, is equal to 40 meters per second. Okay. So mass of baseball, negative in the x, and then I'm going to add my t1 to t2, force of the bat times my dt. Okay. And it's going to be equal to mb, final velocity in the x direction of the baseball as it flies off the bat. And it would have to be v2 cosine 40. So this is 34.9 cosine 40. OK? So far, so good. That's how we set up that impulse equation, which I really wanted to get to today. Um, that's, your, that's one of your, you know, uh, a, a good example, because we've been doing a lot of conservation of momentum today. So I wanted to show you a, an impulse equation. And what we want to do here is make another assumption. We're going to assume that f bat just happens to be constant, and it's happening over a very, very short amount of time. In fact, I'm going to say that bat contacting ball, that dt is estimated to be on the order of a millisecond. It's really, really quick. The bat is swung at high velocity, and it impacts it over a very short amount of time. And so what I can do now is I can say mb negative 40 meters per second plus my f bat in the x. This is f bat in the x multiplied by my dt is equal to my mb 34.9 cosine 40. Okay? And all of that allows me to calculate an f bat in the x. And that value is 10,000 newtons. OK? Probably not. Okay, we won't we won't make you do that. But I'm just saying that, like I said, I want to start the problem off with just what you might know from from your 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 regular knowledge of the game or of the sports, right? And so you should know that a a ball is roughly traveling 90 miles per hour towards the batter. I want to I want to draw your attention to this number though, 10,000. It's really large because of the fact that the impact time is really, really short. And so you need that kind of force in order to change your, your think about this. You're changing the direction of the ball, which was initially flying to this direction. You're completely changing it to this direction. And that required a huge external force. OK? And then so now we still have to figure out the y direction. OK? So y direction, we're going to say zero initial momentum in the y plus f bat y times dt. And this will now equal to mass of the baseball times the v2 sine of 40 degrees. So therefore, f bat y is 3,366 newtons. And therefore, the force 
is actually It's actually a vector pointing in that particular direction having a final magnitude of oops, let's call that alpha. So there's your final answer. And here's, here's the thing, again, you're going you're gonna to realize this very quickly. In these impulse forces, I mentioned this, right? I mentioned the fact that some people will want to draw this free body diagram, right? And they'll say, well, there's a, there's a mass to the baseball MBG. But think about whether or not that in external force actually matters in the context of impulses. This MBG is so small, when you multiply it by this dt, which is one millisecond, this is basically completely negligible compared to the actual force in the y direction, which is why it doesn't, it's normally not considered as part of the external impulse calculation. OK? Yeah. Sorry? OK, so the question is, are you usually given dt, or do you have to find it? Look, you're, you're going to be given, yeah, these are all like textbook questions that we're giving you, right? We're going to give you enough information such that you need to solve whatever you need to solve for. If we're asking you to solve for time, that might be one question. But if we're asking you to solve for something else and you need time, we're going to give you the time. OK? All right. That's a lot of information. I know there's one more section I got to cover on Friday. I'll take one more question. Shh. Hang on one second. No, OK, so the question is, in this problem, you gave a lot of assumptions. Are you expecting me to know all these assumptions? The answer is no. I'm giving you a real life example where someone asks you a question. You have to kind of come up with some estimations to give a reasonable answer. We're not going to do that on an exam. All right? All right, see you guys on Friday. <laughs>